what's interesting is on all kinds of boards that you know are more self-important than actually important, um, like us. Is yeah. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris chat about their most anticipated games of 2017. Plus, impressions from the Nintendo Switch preview event, and Jim hosts a new game show. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 90 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And in our uh, annual tradition, we are opening up the year with a look ahead at our most anticipated games of 2017. Uh, we also have lots of uh, hype about the Switch that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the the event just happened uh, earlier this week. So. Hype? That sounds kind of cynical. <laughs> no, I'm pretty. I'm pretty hyped. Oh, <laughs> well, I will say an inter- interesting um, bit of trivia about the Switch. Mm-hmm. So when you go to search for it on search en- search engines, or um, say you go to Walmart and type in Switch, it still tries to autocomplete Switch Blade. <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't just jump straight to. The console, you have to actually type in Switch, Space, Nintendo. Dude, I would totally buy the Nintendo Switch Blade. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Is it is like a portable system that can also be used for self-defense? Oh, wow. <laughs> Just in case an <laughs> Octorok happens right to come now. by. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but before we get into that, we have the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. This game's been kind of sitting on my uh, shelf for about a month and a half now. I went out and kind of on an impulse buy, bought Valkyria Chronicles Remastered for the PS4. Got a nice uh, steel box edition it came out with, uh, because I'd always been interested in it. It's a a tactical action role-playing hybrid. Um, It actually originally came out for the PS3 in 2008, but earlier this year they released it, re-released it, kind of did like an HD upgrade on some of the textures for the PS4. Um, and I just the first time I actually had an opportunity to sit down and play it with all the other games that have come out and holiday season sort of sapping a lot of my energy. And I'm actually I'm pretty impressed. I'm three chapters in. So essentially, for those that are unfamiliar with this this series, um, so you're sort of in this um, how do I describe it? Like a what 1300s 1400s Euro- European inspired. Um, well, it's it's kind of like an alternative World War II. Oh no, no, it is. But mm. oh, oh well, I guess that's true because they kind of mix in the thing is the thing is they mix in um, things like tanks mm-hmm. with knight armor. See, I yeah. thought it was diesel punk. That's what I thought it was. That's actually a really good comparison. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That that actually is really good because it, it, it I think it is diesel punk. Yeah. Because um, I, I was actually going to say steampunk, but then I was like, that doesn't really fit because it's not really steam yeah. per se. So yeah, I think diesel punk is a pretty fair mm. comparison. Like iron I have, punk. I just invented or, that. Or iron punk. Yeah. Mm. Copyright 2017. <laughs> doc. Backward. Dead. I want to say that your country is an analog for Belgium. No, no, it's definitely uh, Sweden. Is it Sweden? Sweden or Switzerland? Because mm. you have all the um, um, the windmills. Which one has all the windmills? <laughs> 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 I don't want to answer because I might be wrong. (laughs) Well, because that's that's Denmark. uh, That's totally Denmark. True. Well, it's it's not Scandinavia though. You're you're caught in between basically the German analog and the British analog. Yes, and you're also you're also like a neutral country, which is where I got the Switzerland from. Oh, Sweden. But then you all Switzerland was always the neutral nation. Right. Yeah. But then also you have all the windmills, and that's kind of like you know Sweden, Denmark. Those countries Mm kind of had. So what you're saying is you're you're playing as an unimportant country. Yes. Got Mm -hmm. it. You're playing as a small unimportant country, kind of caught in the middle of this war. That was so American. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Of of course, for for a a, a scarce resource, as many wars are fought over, um, we'll just call it unimtadium because I can't remember what it is. (laughs) Um, And that's a great name that I just made up. Um, So James Cameron, eat your heart out. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So. You, this country is rich in this resource, and um, there's this war between, like, like Chris was saying, sort of the German. And when he says German, he specifically means Nazi Germany. Like, it's mm-hmm. very much inspired by 
Uh, they don't seem as car- at least so far don't seem as cartoonishly evil as they could be, mm-hmm. but they're definitely not the good guys, mm-hmm. uh, and they're definitely portrayed as very mil- militaristic. Whereas the the other part of the continent is more, um, you know, the Allied side, which would be places like England, and France specifically, mm-hmm. is what it feels to me like they're yeah. sort of basing it on. Um, so, with that in mind. Uh, the gameplay for this is kind of interesting. So it's presented as though it's like a logbook or a journal mm-hmm. of your sort of adventures. It's it's an account of the war, so it's almost like a history text. Yes, mm-hmm. right. Well, that's neat. Um, but told from like the like a, a personal perspective. Right. So you have these little um, different panels that represent parts of the of the story. So actually, actually if I remember correctly, I think in the in the course of the story, you meet the person who's the author of the book. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. I'm not, I am not there yet. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely not at that point. Um, they do give, they do quote um, her when she's reading off some of the locations and things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I could totally see her being a character at some point because mm-hmm. they, they, she puts her little byline. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so it, you 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 sort of play through it as clicking on different se- uh, sections, and some of them are completely linear storytelling elements. Mm-hmm. Very much has an aesthetic of um, you know anime type storytelling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's certainly, I, I would say it's it's not an immature game. It definitely has, uh, you know, mature elements to it, mm-hmm. but it's also not super serious, dark, anything like that. There's right. definitely that kind of anime. Mm-hmm. Even even when it's mature, it's still kind of funny. Yeah, they, they strike a nice balance, occasionally. I think. They, they I know when so to take too. themselves seriously, but they also have some lightheartedness mm-hmm. and that sort of thing as well. And, and you've played this as well, right, Chris? Oh, yeah, it's actually one of my all-time favorites. Awesome. Did you play the, play, the PS3 version originally? Uh, the original PS3, yeah. yep. So for me, what stands out right away, a couple of things. So... Uh, one would be uh, I, the music and the art style. Oh, the music is amazing. The music yeah. is excellent. The art style has this, it's, it's um, impressionistic. Like it kind of has, uh, it's, it's 3D models, mm-hmm. but cell shaded. Mm-hmm. And also sort of has this kind of, you know, painterly, um, sketchy the, sort the sh- of look to the it. The shadows are kind of hatched as if they were yes. like drawn with pencil. Yeah. Yeah. So so it it gives it this very unique look mm-hmm. that I think really fits um, the the style of the of the story that they're going for the tone of the story, mm-hmm. and then the gameplay itself is actually kind of a mix between something like Fire Emblem and an action RPG. Hmm. So you have this sort of tactical space. You can pick which, pick and choose which character you want to control when. But then when you control that character, instead of just remaining in this sort of top down view and moving them like you're a commander, like you would in say Fire Emblem mm-hmm. or Final Fantasy Tactics, instead you move to this over-the-shoulder, third-person action view. Oh, that's cool. And you can be shot at in real time. You are in real time. Mm-hmm. It's just you have a certain amount of move points, action mm-hmm. points, that you can use to move. You can see the bar sort of depleting at the bottom the bar of the screen. Depleting, yeah. yeah. And at a certain po- at, whenever you want to, you can decide, okay, now I'm going to use my attack. And when you use your attack, time sort of freezes to let you kind of like set up your aim. You have to plan out how, what you want to shoot, for example, like what you want to target. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of things have more than one target. Even a person, you can shoot him in the body, or you could try to go for a headshot, and you're less likely to hit him, but if mm-hmm. you do hit him in the head, you're going to do a lot more damage. And it's really clever. This is actually something that I had I had an idea a while back for how I would do a shooter in a tabletop format, mm-hmm. which is that you'd have some sort of like little reticle that represented where your shot's going to be going, and you sort of randomly determine where the shot's going to go within that circle. Mm. They kind of do that. So they have this big circle that represents where the shot could go. Um, and so you can either try to put the entire circle over their body for more accuracy, or you could like sort of risk missing some shots. And Actually, that there. reminds me of uh, Warhammer 40K's mm-hmm. solution for ordnance. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have yeah. an ordnance template, and then you roll to see where, where it goes. Yeah. And scatter dice. Um, At least course, you used uh, to in the old rules. And then, of course, as you get better and you improve your weapons, you improve your skills, then your circle's going to get smaller because you're getting more accurate. Oh, see, that makes sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm only at Chapter 3 right now, but I assume at some point, am I going to be able to see, like, do I do my characters have stats so they, that their stats increase and grow um, in terms of, like, better aim and things like that? I, I forget the exact details. Um, I believe, though, that as you improve your skills... Um, they can like move further, tend to shoot more accurately. Um, the gear is definitely something you can upgrade, and that helps a lot. Awesome. Um, so yes. So yeah, I've just recently gotten a tank, and I'm very excited about that because the mission right before that, um, I got owned by a tank because <laughs> I, there's a tank just marauding through, and I can do literally nothing to it. And the mm-hmm. mission is basically just avoid the tank and try to get to to the objective without getting killed mm-hmm. in one, in one hit. Tank. So having a tank and being able to 
destroy enemy tanks is, was pretty fun. Yeah, that does sound fun. Now, would you consider this a JRPG? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, yes. Like, without any doubt at all, it's not just that it has elements? Or... Mm-hmm. No, it is, a, it is a JRPG, okay. um, but because it's a tactical RPG, mm-hmm. um, it is more mature in terms of, of gameplay, and because the theme itself is warfare, mm-hmm. and, um, and it does definitely take a serious view of war, it's mm-hmm. not... This guy got knocked out. No, they're dead. Yeah. So it, it is. There's permadeath. You can yes. lose units. So it is certainly a more mature uh, storyline that you might be used to from a typical RP- a JRPG. Yeah, it makes sense to me. This is the Gaming Meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. All right, so uh, at the time of recording, it was just a few days ago that Nintendo had their big uh, live stream event where they uh, debuted the Switch officially. Um, and then the next day, they had the day-long uh, Nintendo Treehouse event where people, uh, media media folks, were able to go in and play the game, and they had uh, demonstrations on the air. Um, did you guys get to see that? Um, I didn't see the full presentation live. Mm-hmm. I did see parts of it afterward. Uh, and then I've also gone back and looked at most of the trailers, so I'm, I'm well aware of all the games, and some of them were pretty cool, yeah. actually. Yeah. Let's pretend like I didn't, and I know nothing about <laughs> it. Okay. Um, well, well, then maybe, Chris, you can start with, why is it called the Switch? <laughs> uh, the reason it's called the Switch is because the, the console is actually um, a very thin, relatively small... Um, it, it, it's act, it could actually be a portable device. Uh, think of it almost like a really big uh, Game Boy, in a sense. Um, That's exactly what I think of the controller for the Wii U as. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it, it is kind of inspired somewhat by the Wii U, I'm sure. It really is. It feels like, the way that it looks to me is it's like they, they took the idea for the Wii U tablet, mm-hmm. and um, the, the side parts where the controls are can actually be removed mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. on the Switch, and then you can put them onto a separate, smaller controller-type setup, so you can actually just use a controller when you have it on the TV. So, obviously, the cool thing about this is you can put two halves of a, say, steering wheel mm-hmm. on, and you're there yep. with, with the driving games, that kind of a thing. Um, I've actually been wanting something like this for a really long time. Imagine a like a, a PlayStation controller that splits down the middle, mm-hmm. uh, and you can just pop it apart and lay it, you know, one hand on the left side, one hand on the right side. That way you don't have to have your hands together in your lap to play. Yeah. I've wanted that for years. Yeah, so you can you can slide off what they call the Joy-Cons. It's the left and right Joy-Cons. Joy-Cons? Yeah. Um, oh. Uh, the idea is that you can share the Joy. Uh, apparently I, when you hand them off to people. Tim, I so, want to send you a Joy-Con right now. <laughs> they, are you, please, get, are you getting the Joy-Con that I'm sending you? <laughs> yeah, you, I, I think they can tell. I, I actually hate that name. Yeah. I really do. Um, and I'm interested in the system, too, but that name, uh, but, uh, Joy-Con. But basically, like, when you have have the the console um, plugged into the dock, then it goes up onto your TV, but then you can actually pull it out of the dock, and then you just have the game on this thing that you can take with you. Um, and when you do that, you can have the Joy-Cons on either side and kind of hold it a lot like the Wii U tablet. Yeah. Um, or you can take them off and put them onto like kind of a mount and have just like a controller with the two sides. Yeah. Or you can use them individually, either like a Wii remote, um, so they're actually keeping motion control and stuff like that. Um, or hold them sideways and use them, like it has all the same functionality, say a SNES. Actually, yeah. it reminds me of a, a of a uh, nunchuck. You remember the nunchuck mm-hmm. attachment yes. to the, for the yeah. Wii? I mean, do, is that still is that still a thing for Wii U? Because I, I don't have a Wii is. U. Yeah. Okay. You can so, use those if you want to on the Wii. On the cool. Wii, yeah. Well, that's that's kind of what it reminds me of, and that's what I always loved about that. Even though you had like this cord across your lap, <laughs> you know, you could play Zelda without having your hands right next to each other. And right. I always thought that was the greatest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can do the same thing if you want to just like hold the two halves, like you know, however you want. Then that's also an option. One of the things I'm excited. To, uh, one of the things I'm kind of excited about, though, is that um, we were talking about like the death of couch co-op games and all this different stuff. And one of the points that we made is that consoles now only come with one controller. Generally speaking, you have to go and that's buy. That's true. That's a really good point. This one actually comes with two. Uh, by virtue of having the left and right Joy-Con. And so there are so many games that they were showing at this event that were, you know, very explicitly multiplayer games. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and local multiplayer yeah, as well. Like, they, they they talked about a, a new uh, Street Fighter Two version mm-hmm. specifically for this. What was it called? Millennium, Millennium Edition? I, I think it was, like, game? Ultra Street Fighter Two, Something like mm-hmm. that, yeah. where it's basically... Um, oh, Street Final Challenger. Was Final Challenger, because yeah. Street Fighter Two was, was a huge system seller for the Super Nintendo. And back in those days, and, and people would sort of flock and try to play Super Nintendo, you know, play um, Free Fighter 2 together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what they did here with, with this new version is kind of interesting, is that you can actually play two versus two. Uh, you can play co-op, mm-hmm. essentially, where you can play two people on the same team versus the computer, like two co- a co-op team, or you can play two versus two. So it kind of increases the number of people that can play 
Um, plus, it really kind of brings back that that local multiplayer element. The mm-hmm. other one was Super what? Bomberman. They have a new Bomberman game coming. How do they? Mm-hmm. And it is um, eight player. Oh, oh wow. wow! At the same time, simultaneous eight player. Well, you know, TVs are finally big enough for that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, is that the assumption that you're all going to be in the same room? Yeah. Well, they they do have online. That's the other thing that they got a little bit of um, flack for their new online policy. As you know, both um, Sony and Microsoft have adopted the um, pay online concept, yeah. which Nintendo hasn't really done, but they're going to do that with the Switch. Uh, give it a couple so, years, no one's going to remember or care. Correct. Right, right. I agree. You, you remember whenever the like the online stuff for uh, PlayStation, basically PlayStation, uh, before PlayStation Plus mm-hmm. was a thing, it was just, you know, PlayStation Online, and it was free, and everybody, wow, it's so amazing. And then instead of them doing, um, okay, now we're going to have an, uh, it, we're, gonna, we're basically going to charge you. Um, there's going to be some free stuff, but basically we're going to charge you for the same thing. They did it, the, uh, brilliant marketing. And it was, uh, okay, everything that you've got now, totally still free. That's that's totally fine. But now there's an additional package that you can get. And it's like an upgrade. And you have to pay for that. But it's just like this amazing upgrade because they, they started charging when they started changing their services. So I think if we look at it in those terms, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what is it we're getting for paying? Because you know, contrary to popular belief, the internet is not free. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is a massive, massive, you know, interconnected series of tubes. money-making no. things. <laughs> not tubes. <laughs> money-making tubes. Yeah, there you go. Um, like those vacuums they have at the bank. Right. Mm. That's exactly right. <laughs> Do they still have those? I do. I think some do. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's great. I never used that's them. Like, that's like straight out of Bioshock, man. Yeah, I think with when it comes to online, people really just want stable servers. And I know trying to play something like uh, Mario Kart or especially Smash Bros. online, yeah, yeah. there are issues. Mm-hmm. So if they if this is now a pay service, dedicated servers, hopefully this will fix a lot of those problems. Mm-hmm. So so some of the big big announcements there, just general game concepts. If we want to just kind of go around and see. What game to you stood out mm-hmm. from that from that announcement? Uh, well, Breath of the Wild was obviously a very big one, right? Of, of, course, of course, we we already we knew already knew about, about that one. one. Right. Um, Super Mario Odyssey looked interesting, but actually, one that they didn't really show or they didn't talk about during like the first event, but they mm-hmm. did show during the Treehouse that I actually uh, it stood out to me was uh, Snipper Clips. Um, and what? this is, yeah, uh, it's called Snipper Clips, and uh, the subtitle's awesome. It's uh, Cut It Out Together. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so each person takes a controller, and basically you play as these shapes. Uh, and the art style is very quirky and very charming. Like, I, that was kind of like the word that came to mm. mind as I was oh, watching this, so was like charming. Um, apparently, it's actually being made by Nintendo, which I, I thought it was just going to be like some sort of indie third party thing, but it's actually Nintendo. Hmm. Um, and it's, it, it's a puzzler where each stage basically have these shapes, and it's kind of like, um, think of like an elongated capital D. You've got a flat end and you've got a curved end. Okay. Um, and when you overlap each other, like you've got one that's magenta and one that's yellow, and they overlap and you see cyan. Um, and that is right there, the shape that it's going to cut out if you choose to cut that out of the other person. Um, so you can strategically um, work together to make someone into a particular shape. And then maybe use that shape that you just made to make another shape out of the other person um, with the objective of filling certain spaces or getting an object from A to B Wait. or uh, popping balloons, for example. You can make yourself sharp so that you can pop balloons. Are you basically Edward Scissorhands at this point? Uh, no, not really. No? Okay. <laughs> um, Sounds like you're an amoeba. Kind of, sort of. Um, not really. It's it, You'd have to kind of see it. It's hard to describe. But it's almost like paper craft, except the paper can cut itself, if that makes sense. Or paper can cut each other. Paperception. <laughs> yeah, um, but it looked, it looked like a lot of fun. It actually looked like a great little cooperative game. Lots of coordination required, um, and then basically just hand each person one of the two Joy Cons, and you're good to go. Okay, so I gotta admit, this is my bias here. I'm actually kind of excited mm-hmm. about the new Nintendo system and the games that are coming out for it because I have an almost three year old. Mm-hmm. And so I recognize that my gaming is going to have to shift a little bit. My own personal meta, if you will, mm-hmm. is going to have to shift for you know what's on the TV mm-hmm. and, and what M games I can play when he's awake and, right. and things like that. Let, let's Witcher 3 when he's around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Uh, and, and even Final Fantasy. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's giant demons on the screen right, or whatever. Right. So um, I'm, I'm kind of following this with a, with a different sort of thought process than I would have even just a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a really cool game, and it sounds like something I'd love to pick up and try to play with my son. Yeah. Um, so 
I don't know. I, I'm kind of excited about this. Maybe we need to, uh, as the time goes by, have a, have a new segment just mm. for, uh, you know, uh, Doc and Son or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, help out the uh, the other gamer parents mm-hmm. out there in the world. There you go. Yeah. Um, what, is, what is suitable to play with your young child? Yeah. Um, but yeah, interesting uh, Dr. news Daddy. about the, there we go. That's it. So, some of the big news about the Switch was that the um, it's going to cost three hundred dollars a release um, coming out March third. That price point is amazing. Mm-hmm. There were quite a few interesting games that they announced uh, that they that people didn't know were going to be at the show. Um, of course, there are rumors that they were going to show the new Mario. You mentioned it briefly. This mm-hmm. Mario Odyssey. Um, I don't know. If, did you have a chance to see the trailer for that one? No, I know nothing about Odyssey. Tell so me. it's really interesting. So they they're sort of looking back at the. Um, more open world style of 64. Oh, really? And Sunshine, I love those. But, I miss those. But making them bigger, like bigger worlds, mm-hmm. more inspired by some of the you know open world games that have become so ubiquitous in gaming now. Sure, yeah. Um, so in this one, it seems it seems like um, you're in a basically New York City or some large city. Yeah. And it's kind of like almost like a hub, literally. That's yes, like just walking around with diff with normal looking people. Yeah, it's so like Mario's running around waist high to all these like normally proportioned people. Yes. <laughs> no, are um, they are they like me people? No, they're no. like real people. Yeah. And then basically, it, like it, to me, like kind of the thought that occurred to me, and I've never seen JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but it was like Mario's Bizarre Adventure. He's going to all these places that are very aesthetically different from what we're used to in Mario. Yeah, um, sounds like it. So like you, you see Mario running around, you can like you know it's the big city at nighttime. So in the background, yeah. there's skies scrapers all lit up and stuff like that it looks and he's, he's swinging off uh you know like light poles yeah. and bouncing off bouncing cars off of and, cars yeah um some of the other announcements that stood out uh to me i mean that one's not coming until holiday season by the way mm-hmm. for super mario odyssey so it's still a little ways off uh they're having a, a sequel to splatoon is mm-hmm. coming splatoon 2 oh that sounds great um they've got um arms actually mm-hmm. i thought was interesting yeah a new ip for nintendo which yes is- and, it, and it felt like to me because and we'll talk about this later, but they didn't really announce anything related to uh, Super Smash Brothers. Mm-hmm. So this arms feels like a almost a stopgap. Mm-hmm. It is it is a competitive game where you're quote fighting mm-hmm. against one another in sort of this cartoony aesthetic. Yeah, seeing them demo it, it actually reminded me of something between Punch Out and the rock paper scissors sorts of mechanics of Pokémon Tournament. Um, of kind of like you know attack, block, grab, like that sort of triangle. Um, and it's like you're shooting at one another, but you're shooting your fists. Mm-hmm. And what's so clever about that is, and you, you can <laughs> literally you shoot your fists really far out, and they're on like you have like stretchy ropes arms, or stre- arms. Like, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's really it's. Yeah. The um, and what's cool about it too is it's that you can play with just buttons, but the idea that they are really pitching is that you're using the motion controls to throw punches. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a clever solution to the problem you had with Wii Boxing, where people would just sit there and just go, uh, you know, like just in really fast succession and not really doing anything coherent. Um, because you have the fist going out and coming back, um, they're going to be able to create this game feel where you, you don't feel tempted to just like randomly waggle right. your fist. Because if you do that, it's going to come right back. You yeah. want to stick it out, hold it out for as long as you want it to extend, and mm-hmm. then pull it back when you're ready. Right. Or it will come back automatically, or whatever that case is. But it's, it's going to keep people from uh, waggling and instead make them think more strategically about when they're throwing the punches. Oh, I'm hoping it goes... I'm hoping you can control how far it goes out because that'd be cool. Like that would if, be I, cool. if I put my hand out, you can definitely it start going out, and then if I pull it back early, it should come back. Yeah, that right is away. That's actually kind of neat. And then I know that for sure you can definitely uh, twist your hand as you throw the punch to make it curve in one direction or the other, which is kind of neat too. Oh, that's clever. Mm. Um, it's like the uh, the power glove, but for <laughs> real, for real, it's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> um, but, but it does look. It looks. It looked fun when I saw it. I know there were f- some people that were complaining about it, but I thought it looked fun. The, the fighters that they had, um, that they demoed, all looked interesting. They had kind of, obviously, all kind of cartoonish mm-hmm. and weird, uh, but interesting. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to see where it goes. I, I kind of am hoping that there's like a, um, you know unlockable Little Mac variant or something. It feels like that would fit in <laughs> Actually, well. yeah, that'd be kind of funny. Um, um, maybe an unlockable Donkey Kong, perhaps. <laughs> but yeah, before we move on, I mean, we could sit here and talk about various games that, that were announced that didn't really give us a release date. Um, but I'd kind of like to talk about, you know, notable omissions, too. Mm-hmm. Because there were some games that people expected them to talk about or announce or at least give some sort of indication that they're coming. But Nintendo didn't mention them at all. And one of the ones that is sort of making waves right now is the fact that there was no mention of Super Smash Brothers at all, which is How not dare they right. It's not that weird just because Super Smash Brothers is is typically not 
a game that comes out at the very start of the console cycle. Yeah. It was a launch title for the GameCube, but every other time it's been kind of like midway through its life cycle. That makes sense. So correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Smash Brothers kind of all about uh, the the cast of characters that you know and love fighting each other? Well, yeah, but okay. so <laughs> more than that. Wouldn't, of course it's more than that, but I mean, isn't that the heart of it? I mean, isn't that the core of, of, of what the whole game is supposed to be about? I'm going somewhere with this. Just say yes. All right. (laughs) So given that, wouldn't you want to give them an opportunity to introduce some new characters from some new products and some new things that we can fall in love with halfway through the development cycle of the console? Oh, Mm -hmm. sure. In order to be able to bring out... I mean, yeah, like, I expect the like new Smash sure. Bros. I, I expect that, for instance, they'll have the uh, the Inklings from Splatoon be playable characters. See, there in this you one. go. Right. That's a great example. And in, in the Wii U, they had um, a, you know a lot of new characters in that version of the game that weren't in the Wii version. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was you know for the better. I mean, there were a lot of of interesting characters they added. Some of them were newer characters like um, Shulk from Xenoblade, mm-hmm. and then some of them were older mm-hmm. characters that had never been in Smash before, like Little Mac from Punch Out. Yeah. So. And then, of course, different third-party characters as well, like Mega Man. So there's some cool, there's some cool things that they can do with the series for sure. Um, I, I don't really think it's anything to be worried about. I just wanted to bring it up. It's time for Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. So today's Game Show, we're going to try to see about, uh, speaking of notable omissions from the Switch, uh, from the Nintendo show, I'm going to name some uh, classic Nintendo franchises, and y'all are going to try to guess how many years it's been since there's been a new release. This is going to make me feel old. Yeah, probably will, actually. (laughs) You know, I turned 41 this week. (laughs) That is old, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you may uh, send Doc your gift cards to inbox at backward-compatible.com. <laughs> <laughs> send Mrs. Doc your condolences. <laughs> so remember, Doc, no matter how old you get, I will always be younger. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> That's, uh, that doesn't help. I suppose this is a true statement. Uh, <laughs> Does that also mean more mature? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. Because I can That's... disprove that quickly. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go right into it. You know what? Let's start with F Zero. F Zero is is, is a, a futuristic racing series, but Captain Falcon has been appearing in Smash Brothers a lot more often than his own games lately. Mm-hmm. So just how just how lately? Now, wasn't there supposed to be a twist where one of us would guess the year and then like the yes. other one tries to go over? That's exactly under- what's going to happen. Okay. So one of y'all is going to guess, mm-hmm. um, not the year, how many years it has been. This is 2017. I'm not going to get super technical with the month. Mm-hmm. It's just whatever the year is. Okay. So this is 2017. So we're blanketing this as 2017. Yes. Okay. So I want to say that the last F-Zero release was on the Game Boy Advance, and that was after um, the GameCube one. 2004, so 13 years? 13 years? Doc, are you going to take the over-under? Uh, I think he is... Well, hold on. If I, say, if I say over, does that mean that it was after that? Yes. That's confusing. Yes. Okay, so so I'm, I'm you're, you're, you get to pick over thirteen years the, would be do earlier. You think, than yeah, that. do you think it's well, yeah? Do you think it's over thirteen years or under thirteen years? I think it is less than thirteen years since we had that, meaning that if he were to give that date, he would be low. I think it was a higher date, so he's under in his estimation. See, it's backwards. <laughs> Just tell us the answer, Jim. Sure, not sure. It. Let's do it. That, let's do it that way. So you you can say that you think that he is, you think that it's less, fewer than thirteen years, less, less or more. We'll just I think do less or more. I think it is. I think it is fewer than thirteen years. Okay. I think that is correct. I think he has way overshot it. Okay. I think it's more like about eight or nine. Hmm. Chris, it is exactly thirteen years. Oh, ah, suck. Nice. <laughs> that means I had Which no chance. Which makes me very sad. I had no <laughs> chance whatsoever. You're exactly right. Two thousand four. It. it was F Zero Climax on the GBA. I basically got not exactly, but basically, I'm twice as old now. I am twice as old now than I was when I played. Uh, my last F Zero game. Bah, that's nothing. I'm so old. I don't even know what that game is or what you're talking about. <laughs> wow. Um, you, really. give, you give zero Fs, in other words. Yeah, no. I, it, <laughs> okay, Doc, this is... This I can is, honestly say I, I did not get excited about Climax. <laughs> so this is not a trick question. I will say that right away. I okay. like to play around with this. All but right. in all seriousness, 
Metroid. Met, the original Metroid. The series, the Metroid series. How long has it been since there has been a Metroid? Oh, I see. The most, so you're talking, looking for the most recent entry in Metroid. How many years has it been? By the way, we're not counting spinoffs. So okay. the, the recent release, Federation Force, mm-hmm. that, is a, <laughs> that is a spinoff. Okay. It's not part of... Because you, you don't play as Samus or Anne. You know, it's not actually. I mean, it is a spin, just like how you don't Mar- play as Metroid. Got it? Right. You don't yeah. play. You don't play as Mister Mister Metroid. Mister <laughs> Metroid. Mister Metroid. The the, oh, the manly man. space marine. Okay. So and you know how you know how you know that it's a manly space marine because he has giant traps. Look at those shoulders. Totally. Right. Right. Yeah. Couldn't be a woman in that suit. Of course not. Of course uh, not. Okay. Absolutely. I'm gonna go with seven years. So I think it was 2010. I don't, you don't have to tell me the year, but you uh, think it's seven years. Seven years. Did Did you want to throw in just like? As a bonus for no extra points, what game that was? Well, I think it was Other M, wasn't it? Well, I can't tell you. Well, okay. um, Chris? I'm going to go over. I think it was 2009. So with... that would be under. No, no, he thinks he thinks that it was more. I think it we're was... doing more. We're doing. Oh, I like, said 2010. Fewer, You're saying 2009. Fewer or more. Yes, that is more. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Says, yeah. so you think I'm off by a year or two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Doc, you are exactly right. Yeah! Yeah, we're, we're good at this, apparently. <laughs> you guys are really good at this. You guys are really good so far. Yes, it was Other M, which I, I did have to preface that by saying it's not a trick question. So you okay, knew, yeah. Even though I personally don't count Other M as a real Metroid I game. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. It is, it is officially a, a real Metroid game. It, it is canon. Yes. Actually, in terms of its, its whether it's canon or not, that remains to be seen. A little, a little fuzzy. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it is officially a part of the series. That's really all that matters. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. This is another classic Nintendo series um, that... We haven't seen, we haven't necessarily seen a lot of it in recent times. It's your turn, right, Chris? It is Chris's okay, turn to Chris's guess. Turn. I will be silent. Okay. Kid Icarus. Ooh. <laughs> um, wow. How many years has it been? That is classic. <laughs> that was, I'm trying to remember when the 3DS came out. I'm going to say four years. Okay. Doc? Okay, so the question is, when was the last time something that could be considered Kid Icarus came out. Yes. All right, I think he's way low. I'm going to go higher. It's been longer than that. Okay. Chris, you said how many years? Four? Yep. Doc wins, but barely. <laughs> yeah! 2012. Okay. Okay. Well, what was it? What, what came Kid out? Kid Icarus Uprising actually came out on the 3DS. So this is a trick question. Yeah. I wanted to see if it y'all was a knew trick. that I, this I, didn't, I, I knew about Uprising. Yeah. Well, he didn't preface that it wasn't a trick question, so we should have assumed it was. <laughs> well, it wasn't a trick in the sense that it's technically... Not everyone knows about Uprising. Yeah, it's, Uprising it's a mobile, wasn't... mobile game? It, it was, was a 3DS. No, oh, okay. it was a 3DS game, but it, but it wasn't... It also plays totally differently from the original. It's, oh. it, it plays pretty differently, but you... I still think it's fair to say it is part of the series. Yes. Funny, because you're still, you're still playing as Pit. Oh, really? Okay. Like, Metroid Prime is plays quite differently from the original Metroid series, but mm-hmm. it's still part of Metroid because yeah, yeah. you're still playing the same character, it's the same storyline. Kind of. um, okay. This is a classic Nintendo series. We haven't seen hide nor hair of it, possibly, for quite some time. Really? Okay. How many years has this been since we've seen an entry in the Balloon Fight series? The Balloon <laughs> Fight series. Good old balloon fight. But you are you are aware of, you've played balloon fight, I say. I have no idea what you're talking about. Really? I have no clue what this is. You really have never you've heard so about it. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. I'm it's gonna a, it's assume, a Nets classic. I'm gonna, it is, it is okay. a classic So like eight the bit. original the original wow. the original okay. balloon fight. Well to be fair, instance. I was living in another country at the time, literally under yes. a rock no. Uh, <laughs> to, to figuratively be, under a rock. For those who may not have uh, may not have heard of of the original, um, you're probably aware of Joust. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Balloon Fight was basically Nintendo's version of Joust. Oh, okay. It's kind of similar. <sighs> you're you're being you're you floating around on balloons, mm-hmm. and you try to pop the other person's balloon to make them fall down, and then okay. you knock them out. I think it has been twenty two years, twenty five years. Yeah, let's go with twenty five years. Twenty five years. And what what game is that? Do you think it is that came out last? Just out of curiosity. Oh, I have no idea. So you just in think... the in the balloon fight series. I'm just curious. Bl- balloon. But you don't know. Super balloon fight. <laughs> Twenty five years. Okay, Chris. Um, I'm going to go with the under. Just assuming there's some sequel to Balloon Fight that I've never heard of that came out after the NES. 
but it could also be a trick question that there's no real, there's not really a balloon fight series so much as there was just a balloon fight, and that was it. Don't leave us in suspense. Man. And that is the answer. There, there, yeah. there it's just <laughs> it's just one game. Dog, dog <laughs> gotcha. Um, 1984. All right. Although then there were of course ports. By way of total guessing, <laughs> I'm a victor. I win. <laughs> In your face. In your face. As as it goes on the BackwardGabble.com podcast, (laughs) we we win by way of guessing. By way of guessing. So I'm going to have to give Doc Doc gets the overall victory here with more correct answers. But that was good. That was good. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. So we're going to dive right in uh, with our most anticipated games of 2017. Uh, I, I think it's going to be it's a little bit ironic in the sense that some of the ones that are on my list, at least, are uh, the same ones that I was most looking forward to for 2016. Uh, but delays and such have, <laughs> Amen to that. have uh, resulted in them being uh, my most anticipated for this year. So hopefully they actually come out this year. Uh, we don't get yet more delays. Uh, one of those actually is um, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which they did confirm during the Switch event is going to be March 3rd. Um, As in, it is, it is a launch title. Yes, it is a launch title. Now, are they going to do what they did with Twilight Princess and have it come out like a week later for the GameCube? Probably, In yeah. this case, a week later or for the Wii U. Wii U, yeah. More importantly, are they going to flip the entire world left to right? And no, mirror? That, there's, there's no reason for it this time. Yeah, okay. that wouldn't really make sense this time. Yeah. Yeah, the reason they did it before was the controller, right? It was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because they figured that more people were going to be right-handed, so they thought it'd be more natural if Link was also right-handed in Twilight Princess for Wii Yeah, But I sense. think in this case, Link... Is just straight up right. Yeah, I think he's just straight from the start. Right handed. Yeah. yeah, man, they broke Link. <laughs> well, it's a different Link. It says you. <laughs> he finally stopped being evil. What? You know, left <laughs> left handedness is the devil. That was the whole. You insulting my dad? No, doing? I'm just saying that was the whole. That was a whole thing back in you know, ye, old, ye, ye olden times, <laughs> ye olden wow. days. What? Where they tried to train people not to be left handed if they were because they thought it was like. Satanic or my, something. My, my father taught me that you, uh, everyone's born left-handed, and you become right-handed when you commit your first sin. <laughs> <laughs> he's a pastor. He wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> and obviously, he can't because he's left-handed. A little bit of fun uh, trivia for you guys. Uh, actually, the the ye and ye old was actually uh, supposed to be the uh, the the y is basically a. Another way of writing the thorn, I think, thorn is what it's called. Thorn is the correct letter, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and so uh, anything you see that's ye old tavern is actually supposed to be the old tavern. Uh, so, fun facts. That's ye oldie. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can impress your friends with that one. You'll be super popular at parties. So. I'm yeah. so sure it, that's true. It, <laughs> unless you're trying to pronounce it like the Swedish chef from the Muppets, <laughs> then it's ye old tavern. Right. <laughs> work, work, work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so how, how do we want to do this? Do so, we wanna just, like, I, I just say throw out games and talk about them. We talked a lot about Breath of the Wild, and I'm certainly anticipating it quite a bit. Um, I, I to the point where I want to play it day one. I mean, I'm I'm really into this game. Everything I see about it looks great. I was one of the people that was disappointed in Skyward Sword. I know a lot of a lot of people kind of were a lot of fans. Yeah. Um, it wasn't to say that it was a terrible game, but it just did not live up to the expectations that Legend of Zelda has created. I gotta be honest, I haven't played a Zelda game since Four Swords. Well, there's been, there's certainly been some really good Zelda games since and I know you just have played them. I know. Like, Wind Waker was excellent. Well, I've, Twilight I played, Princess I played Wind Waker. was excellent. I played Wind Waker. I played Twilight Princess, too. Mm. But Four Swords came out after all that. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, maybe I'm just calling it the wrong thing. Um, there was the one that came out for uh, you, you Game mean, Boys, but then there was the one that actually came out for Game Cubes. Yeah. The Four Sword Adventures? Four Sword Adventures. Yeah, yeah, I had that one. The funny story about that, I, I loved that game. I thought it was really yeah, cool. Yeah, it was a great little game. Um, I loaned it to someone, mm-hmm. and I can't remember who it was. No, and I can't find it. I don't know where it went. <laughs> so you want that back? Oh, okay. So it's like, uh, I, I couldn't, I thought it was one of my friends, and like, he's like, I don't have it. I thought it was my sister for a while, and she's like, I don't have it. It's like, I can't find it. Well, I haven't game. known you that long, so I'm off the hook, actually. Yeah. But uh, um, but I, I thought Twilight Princess came out after, because it was like, it was released simultaneously when the Wii launched, yep. which is why I think it came out well, after. Well, you know, I had it on GameCube. I didn't have it on, on Wii, actually. So, um, now you, you're saying that, though, makes me, me think, because I did play a Zelda on Wii, that would have been Twilight Princess. It must that have was been the one Twilight that was Princess. Mirrored. And that one was a good game. That was a very good that game. That was a I good thought. game. I enjoyed it. I then, never beat it, though. 
Really? Yeah, no, uh, yeah I think it's worth Wind it. Wind Waker was the last one I beat. The the final dungeon in Twilight Princess is actually one of the best final dungeons. In I've been told that it's it's excellent. Um, it, it's you're in you know Hyrule Castle, yeah, but it also really feels like a castle, which oh, is yeah. kind of a big yeah. shift from the, for the yeah. series. So I recommend uh, you know if you have some time, they of course release the um, if you have a Wii U. The remastered version mm-hmm. of Twilight Princess. Well, I don't, yeah. but the way I'm thinking it is, you know, now I just wait, and they're going to release all the old stuff, uh, mm-hmm. in, in theory, and, and hopefully. Uh, but see, this this is this is one of those weird dichotomies for me. I try not to buy new systems specifically for a, a game or two that when it comes out. I typically wait until sort of the second wave of a system mm-hmm. before I buy it. Um, that said, I didn't for the uh, PlayStation 4, and I actually ended up having my, my PS4 for almost six or eight months before any really good, solid games that I wanted to play had come out. Yeah, the PS4 launch window was pretty bad. It was. There was of, almost nothing for like the A lot of free year. stuff and little dinky yeah. downloads, but the truth is that that was just a bunch of ports. Mm-hmm. It wasn't stuff for PS4. Um, so... Again, uh, but in this case, I Breath, remember Breath the, of the Wild. That's right, a, that I looks know. Pretty, of course, it is also on the Wii U. So I'm torn, fair. but I don't have a Wii U. Right. So there's again extra incentive there. Yeah. It, it it's making me think with that price point, three hundred bucks, I'll probably do it, but I may wait till Christmas. Basically, you know, it may be my my my. Uh, my holiday ah. request. Well, it might take that long to be able to get it. Um, I managed to sneak in my pre-order mm-hmm. the morning after the event, um, but then a friend of mine, like I think the next day, wanted to go and pre-order his. Yeah, and it's not available. Anymore. Are they going to do the scarcity thing again? I think it's just um, a lot of people like the event, and they it's just sold out everywhere right oh. now. So. The hope is that they're going to. I couldn't find one because I, I waited. I waited a couple of days. Yeah. The hope is they're going to ramp up production and open up another round of pre-orders, but uh, we'll see what happens. I'm sure they will, just because of the from now. I mean, from now until the holiday, that's a huge gap. Mm-hmm. Likely, there will be a ton of them available in the summer, mm-hmm. and then they'll start to become scarce again for the holidays in, in 2017. Well, what's like, the official release date year. of the system? March 3rd. March third. Okay. So it's coming out pretty soon. Is mm-hmm. part of, part of the issue, mm-hmm. but because there's such such a big gap between when it releases and the holidays, there's no way it's going to be scarce all the way through the holidays. So it's, they're going to probably have a lot of a lot of them in the summer months, mm-hmm. and then when it gets closer to the holiday, from people Christmas, are getting it for gifts. Then it'll be sold out again because it'll right. be that makes sense. like a hot Christmas thing. Because that's when Mario comes out too. So you're saying get it in June or July. Yeah, I'm saying if, if you want to get it for, mm-hmm. like, your Christmas, I'd say pretend that it's Christmas in July. Because <laughs> you, you may not get it for Christmas if you wait. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's certainly one I'm looking forward to. Obviously, Super, Mar- Super Mario Odyssey that we talked about earlier is mm-hmm. another one I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to. Um, a much more recent release, Resident Evil 7, comes out later this month. Mm. So I played the demo. I thought it was really interesting. Um, this The demo might be the uh, the prologue. To the game, or it might be something completely disconnected from it. But either way, um, it's it's it got my juices flowing, my creative juices. Okay, <laughs> um, caught so, yourself there. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm I'm gonna pick it up towards the end of the month. I mean, I'm I'm interested in playing mm-hmm. it, and uh, the best part about it is that it's almost here for me. So you know, I'm. It's been a while since I've been excited to play a Resident Evil game. The last Resident Evil that I thought was actually. Um, really good and worth playing was Resident Evil 4, which was another GameCube release, actually, this, since we talked about GameCube a bit earlier. That was a good console. Um, I, I think it was was as well. And Resident Evil 4 was a fantastic game, um, kind of a, a departure in the series because it went a little more action-oriented than mm-hmm. some people were used to. Um, with the new Resident Evil, Resident Evil 7, it also feels, feels like a departure for the series because, uh, I don't know if you all have had a chance to play the demo yet, but it's almost Silent Hill-like mm-hmm. in the way it presents itself. You mentioned that, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's um, it's also first person, which is, of course, different. Um, but it certainly feels different. But I, I welcome that. Like, you don't feel like um, that you're some sort of a badass in this one, like mm-hmm. you are in, in most of the rest of the series. So it's kind of bringing on more of the horror survival element and less of the kind of like action with some scary aesthetics mm-hmm. element. But you still you still have weapons, you still had guns. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had I had a gun for all good it did me, but mm-hmm. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so speaking of things that are coming out really soon, actually I think this coming week is going to be uh Valkyria Revolution. 
Hmm. Um, we were talking about the Curio Chronicles earlier, and uh, this is something that I just I basically pulled up the Wikipedia article of 2017 releases uh, before we did the show to see, just kind of jog my memory. And so I saw that thing, and it's like, oh, hey, I had no idea this was coming, but like, I love Valkyria Chronicles, so I'm going to grab it. Um, I watched a little bit of gameplay footage, and it looks like it's a little bit of a departure from what I know Valkyria Chronicles as. Um, this looks more like a action RPG um, than it does like a tactical RPG. Um, now, I'm sure there are going to be some tactics involved, um, but it looks like it's definitely evolved its uh, gameplay formula a little bit. It looks like they, they have more real-time stuff going on, and like occasionally it'll stop and be able to aim where you want to throw your grenade or something like that. Um, but then otherwise it seems like you're, it's kind of playing like a party-based action RPG, mm. uh, which is intriguing. So I'm definitely interested to learn more about it. Um, what little I saw looked cool, to be, to be sure. Um, and uh, I played Valkyrie Chronicles 2 on the PSP briefly. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as good as the first one, I didn't think. And then Valkyrie Chronicles 3, I think, was also portable only and was only in Japan. So that one, mm-hmm. uh, Americans didn't even get to play that one. So Well, another release that, that I know I'm extremely excited for, and I believe Doc is excited for as well, Red Dead Redemption 2. Yes, very much so. It's supposed to come out in the, either the third or fourth quarter of 2017, which when I see a release that says that, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, it's actually going to come out in the next year. 18, yeah. So it probably will, but I actually looked it up just to kind of be sure. Um, and I, I found out, and this actually does make me feel kind of old. Doc, would you like to take a stab at how many years it's been since the first Red Dead Redemption came out? Okay, so I actually have, have kind of a, a reference point on this one. Okay. Because it's also when I started teaching university mm-hmm. and pretty close to when I got my doctorate. Um, I want to say it was 2008, so it's been nine years? No, nah, it actually was 2010. Really? Yeah. But, I mean, for me, I honestly, I, I didn't realize it was that, that long ago. Still, yeah, that's yeah, six seven, years seven, ago. Seven years ago, yeah. Uh, and, and I apparently was entirely wrong, so there you go. Clearly, I lost two years. Wow. It was the aliens. <laughs> but Or possibly the dissertation, I don't and, know. And for me, maybe it's because I've actually replayed the game multiple times. Yeah. Um, in fact, I replayed it all the way through maybe a year ago. Really? So maybe for me, um, it, that's part of the reason why I didn't quite recognize that it's been sure, this yeah. long. But that's a long gap for them. Yeah. For a game that was, as I recall when it came out, it was very highly regarded critically. Like, it won multiple awards. Right. It got all this acclaim for everything from its soundtrack to the gameplay well deserved, to the I story. Say. Everything. Oh, I agree. It's it a excellent. beautiful, beautiful game. Uh, the, the sort of underrated gun from the two generations prior, I think, is uh, one that has a very strong candidacy to be noticed as a precursor, shall we say. Um, so if you haven't played Gun, go dig out your old Xbox the original Xbox, not your Xbox One, but your Xbox I like to call one. it Xbox Fat. Oh, there you go. Because you can't call it Xbox One. I know, because it's confusing. silly, right? Um, but no, the, the original yeah. Xbox, and then grab a copy of Gun and play it, because it, hmm. it's a great game. Um, it's pretty linear, but at the same time, there's there's open-world elements to it that were before their time. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that game, but I haven't mm-hmm. have never played it's a great it. great game. All right, so I'm actually... Really excited about this. I know you guys know that I am. Horizon Zero Dawn looks like it's perched to be Sony's big title game for the next couple of years. Mm. Um, so, this one's on my list, too. Yeah, I think that it is probably going to kind of replace um, sort of the Assassin's Creed kind of um, notability, shall we say? That's my prediction. That's my reckless speculation mm. bonus there for, for this. Um, and it's kind of like a game that can be a flagship title for the PlayStation. Correct. Like, that is exactly a right. A good reason to get a PS4 is for Horizon Zero Dawn. Right. And not only that, but I think that it's going to open up a series in a great uh, new world. The beautiful apocalypse is what so I call it. So the next one will be like Horizon 1 Dawn, and then we'll have Horizon 2 Dawns. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then in the movie theaters will be Rogue 2. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wait, then sh- shouldn't it be Horizon Zero Dawns? Or maybe it'll be Horizon Zero Dusk. And then hey, wait a minute. How do you know it's the horizon if there's no dawn, right? Hmm. There, there this are... doesn't make any sense, <laughs> this title. It's like working with Heckle and Shackle. <laughs> so in all seriousness, um, here's the thing. There, there's actually been some concern and speculation in the, just the last few days because of a... Um, let's call it a clerical error, mm. which said that they were going to be pushing Horizon Zero Dawn again. 
It's not true. I mean, the thing is probably boxed up already. I mean, we've got like a month till the release date. So maybe they just meant like they're they're really pushing this product. Like right, we're, we're promoting it. Yeah, it was supposedly <laughs> just a clerical error. But but like people freaked out over this. Oh no, they're pushing it again. And obviously, the reason that they're pushing it is because of the Nintendo Switch. Mm. Obviously, that I mean, there's too much of a. I mean, it's it's going to be there's going to be the Zelda thing. There's going to be all this other stuff. And so really, yeah, the Switch does come out. What three days after it releases? Yeah, so basically that is going to actually take some of the fire out of it. I know it is, and so they're they're really. I I think there's some genuine concern there, Um, but then what's interesting is on all kinds of boards that you know are more self-important than actually important, um, (laughs) like us is (laughs) is there's this sort of. um, Firestorm over the last couple of days of oh maybe they really should you know as as a reaction to that sort of clerical error of um, oh it's so good that they're that they're pushing it again and then now it's like they're not pushing it well how dare they not push it what a stupid decision that they're not why don't push- they push it up if it's already ready why not release it like you know well I, I suspect they're probably stamping out those discs now oh, okay. you know what I'm saying and then there's a warehouse full of them but not enough and so I, I'll say this with Horizon Zero Dawn it's a game that I am tentatively excited about. Mm-hmm. If it, if it because, lives up to what it's trying to do. Yeah. Well, have you seen the cinematic trailer? The new cinematic trailer just came out a couple days ago. No. I haven't seen the new cinematic trailer, but quite frankly, I don't put stock in cinematic trailers at all but when it comes enough. to playing a game. But, but see, you got to understand, for a long time... Unless it's Death Stranding. Right, of course. Of course. <laughs> well, that was running an engine, so... You know. <laughs> I withdraw the point. I concede the fight. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean... For a long time, all we've had of this game is basically a, a demo. They didn't call it that, but that's really what it was. It wasn't a playable demo. It was just a, re- a recorded demo. Right. Because you'd search for a video, and, and clearly it was the same space being played through three or four or five different times. Mm-hmm. It was different iterations of the exact same Tyrannosaurus Rex fight. Mm-hmm. You start up on the mountain, you come down, you kill the little gazelle things, mm-hmm. you, you take down the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Which, which is encouraging because it then does suggest that there is what they were trying to say, that there is, that the bosses, the boss fights can be truly dynamic yeah. because you can approach them different ways. I saw that T-Rex go down four or five different ways, mm-hmm. and it was cool. It got really encouraging to me. that Some people chose to knock the rockets off, take it down with the rockets. Others chose to, like, you know, stamp it down to the ground. Then there was a play demo, which was, I don't know, about six months ago, and that was really encouraging because it was a big swath of Earth. And then there was some story demo stuff where she went into a little village, and, and there were, you know, right. please go right. do this, and then go there. And that was great. But now we've got the the story demo, which is more than just trailer. Um, and this one came out a couple of days ago? A couple ago? of days ago. I don't want to spoil it, but... Um, yeah, I'll check it out But it's, it's well worth looking at because, man, um, the potential for this kind of an open world experience for solving the mystery, I'll tell you what it reminded me of, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but it reminded me of the plot to Fallout 2. Hmm. Open world... You gotta go find uh, X, and, and in that particular case, it was a Gek, right? You go find right. the Gek kit. Fallout One, it was go find the water chip. Right. That's what it reminds me of. There's a secret out there in the Forbidden Lands, and you gotta go find it. And it's basically, if you just charge straight on out there, you're going to die. So you've got to kind of learn the ways of the land, and and it's. Seems to me like hmm. you're not just she's not just leveling up her own skills and abilities, but she's actually leveling up her tech. And because she's leveling up her tech, she's also upgrading her tech. And, and, and as she upgrades her tech, she can take down new hmm. beasts. And as she takes down new beasts, she can level it up some more. Doc, doc if you called Guerrilla Games, and because that just saying that to me, it's gotten me more excited. I know. Me. We'll go watch the trailer. If that's true, but, if, if that is true, obviously that's, that's, that's some speculation. Based it, on there what is we've some seen, spectrum, but, but if what, that's true, but that's also mean. Pulling out because I've been watching this game religiously, which is dangerous because I've gotten <laughs> excited about it. Right, um, and 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 one could easily compare it to say Final Fantasy fifteen, where I literally knew nothing about it, and Chris was like, "Hey, you should check this game out." And I'm like, "Well, as it happens, my dad had a copy and he loaned it to me, mm-hmm. and I started playing it, and I loved it." Mm-hmm. Um, this game, I already am in love with it, and I'm afraid that it's not going to work out. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's always interesting when you go into a game with kind of a notion of what it's going to be, yeah. and then it's 
not quite that, and it can still be really good, but if it's not what you were expecting, there's still a little bit of a letdown. Bingo. Yeah. I personally call this the Stargate effect, not because <laughs> of anything to do with the Stargate technology, mm. but having to do with the fact that way back in the 90s, I saw that movie without having a clue what it was. My friends just dragged me to it, and they're yeah. like, it's this cool movie, it's called Stargate. That's okay. my experience with it, too. And, and I, it, was, it blew me away. Yeah. And, and I watched every episode of every series that came after it and loved it and was in love with that show for years and years and years and years and years. And years. It didn't age well, but no. still, the the love is there, the fondness, the nostalgia is there, and it will always be there. And I hope they reboot it. They've been talking about making um, some new movies um, because of that Stargate effect. Whereas I know s- way too much about Star Trek, <laughs> and I and I love Star Trek, mm-hmm. and I know Star Trek, and the new Star Trek movies came out, and I went and I saw them, and I hated them. Oh yeah, I'm with you. Hated but them. that's because they changed they. Well, it's because they, they changed sucked. them. They're not really Star Trek. Right, exactly. It's because they sucked. Uh, that's that's my totally objective no, opinion. They just sucked. Uh, uh, I don't want to get off on a Trek rant. But I mean, <laughs> I, I think I'm pretty open to different Trek experiences. I liked Enterprise. Yeah. And a lot of people yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty open, but I'm sorry. It, what the, I, the first movie was okay, but the second movie was trash. To read between the lines, what I'm really yeah. saying here is if I hadn't had all that love for the new Trek stuff, mm. I probably would have liked it just fine. Mm. That's what I'm really saying. Um my preconceived bias sets such a high standard that it's going to be really hard to live up to. And honestly, that's the problem I have with all of what we're doing today with these anticipation of the games. Mm-hmm. I try to find that happy place between anticipating it and then enjoying when it came. Oh, that game came out that I was looking forward mm-hmm. to. Cool, I'll go pick it up. As opposed to the midnight release yeah. hype that I prepaid mm-hmm. and already have like the season pass for. <laughs> I don't know. I like, may be done with that. So, like, you know, a good example of that for me is another game I'm looking forward to this year is Mass Effect Andromeda. Oh, um, yeah. Which I've, I've I've been aware of its development for a while, but I've not been watching any trailers. I've not been seeing any gameplay. I've not been following anything about mm-hmm. it. I have just a very vague sense of what they're going for. Um, and it was kind of one of those things like, oh, it's coming out sooner than I thought. And I'll pick it up and I'll play it and I'll, you know, probably, probably like it, I hope. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not... Riding the hype train on that one. How many um, blue and green alien babes can you get with in this one? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> and dudes. And dudes. I, my understanding is you get to uh, explore a little bit more freely this time. It's more about exploration okay. and checking out this galaxy. But I, other and, than that, finding, the galaxy, I finding the di- different okay. people on the different, <laughs> romancing different people on different planets in the that's, galaxy. That's not why course. I play Mass Effect. Uh, I'm, but, <laughs> I'm being, I'm being kind of sure, serious, sure. But yeah. I, no, I mean honestly, I do hate that aspect. But I, honestly, I have, I have no <laughs> idea just because I haven't been following this at all. Uh, so uh, no, I'm sure there will be. Jim, it's more about free exploration. Oh right. The awkward silence. <laughs> All right, so I want to throw out a term here. Sure. Mind share. You're familiar with this one? Uh, sounds I don't familiar. think so. It sounds okay, so basically what this is in, 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 in from a sales perspective, because, you know, there are three, let's call them legs to the stool in the games industry. And, and the first, of course, is that you've got to have that, that idea. You know, you've got to have the, the artist in play there, the, 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 the designer, if you will. You've got to have the developer, the ones who actually do the crunchy stuff, teams of 400 people. We've called them voices before. Um, and then that third one, um, which is basically that marketing aspect of it. And it's not a dirty word. And you have to sell the thing in order to... Right, no, of course, of course, of course. Um, so... What? It's only dirty when they when they intentionally try to mislead the public. Right. This is a different model than right. than than the the triple model that where the player is an artist. I'm not yes. talking about that. Yes. I'm talking about a model by which um, the the game itself as a commercial product mm-hmm. succeeds because it has those three elements in it. Yes. As a stool of a uh, three legged stool, right? Okay, leg of a three legged stool. I prefer four legged stools, but that's right because then it won't fall over. Right. But that's the point. It's a three legged <laughs> stool; and it will fall over. Um, so mindshare is this idea in that third leg of the stool, the commercial aspect of the stool, of I can only have a certain percentage of the people thinking about my product at any given time. All right. Or another way to look at hmm. it is how, what percentage of your mind is dedicated to thinking about my product right now? Um, so in, in game terms... About 25% of my mind share for anticipated games and what's coming out is uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, which is higher than any other game because there's dozens of games in there. Mm. Um, So it's a bit like 
on on television when you're looking for like the uh, you know the, the the percentage of the views kind of a thing. Yeah. Mindshare is the anticipation factor for your game. So there's a huge mindshare for Nintendo's new console that's out there, right? Mm-hmm. How do you compete with an 80% mindshare? Yeah. And, and in particular, the new Legend of Zelda that is a launch title right. for it. Yeah. When your game launches three days before the new game. And that's a very real question. Well, I think it's to the point where you know people are not probably not going to be talking about Horizon Zero Dawn much leading up to its release because of that date. I think you're right. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm predicting the game is going to fail. I don't. Mm. And I, I am hopeful that what you're saying is true. And I, I'm more excited the more I, I look at it and remind myself, this is Guerrilla Games. This is not Activision. Yeah. This is, I have to keep telling myself, <laughs> this is not Ubisoft. Right. This is not Activision. Right. This is Guerrilla Games. Because I have this, you know, Activision has a tendency to pump out some games that are not particularly high quality. Mm-hmm. Um, Ubisoft, I've had this love-hate relationship with because they tend to <laughs> rush games like Far Cry and Assassin's Creed out, and a lot of times they, under, they disappoint. Right. And they, they do a lot of games in the open world space, so that's where that connection might, you know, come into play with yep. Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm-hmm. No, different developer. Now, granted, they've never done a game like this before. Mm-hmm. They're known for Killzone, but at least... Someone else. So I have to keep reminding myself of that. I am interested in the concept. I, I feel like it's both good and bad. And, I, I, and overall, I think it's good that there's a lot about the game that we don't know. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. So I think that's good. Um, so it, 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 it's bad in the sense that it gives you this notion of you get to fill in the gaps. And that's sort of the danger of like, like what, you, what you were pitching to me, this concept of, oh, it's going to be like the Fallout games. Are you gonna, that's awesome. If that's mm-hmm. how it is, I want to fall in love with this game. Right. But that's not necessarily how it is. We don't know. And one of my favorite moments whenever I'm starting a new TV series, watching a movie, less so because usually the trailers give everything away now, uh, so, read, reading a new kidding. book or uh, picking up a new video game, those first few moments where I start to play or start to read or watch it where I don't know where it's going to go, but I anticipate where it's going to go. And uh-huh. I try, and I, in my head, I have this idea of where it's going to go. And I get excited about where it can go, you know, assuming I'm enjoying it those first, like, hour right. or so. Right. That's a great time to be in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, oftentimes, when you actually get to where you, where you want it to go, it ends up being a disappointment. Right. Not in the sense that it was bad, but it doesn't live up to, you know, what I thought it was going to yeah. be. And that's not, that's not saying that, oh, what I thought it was going to be, well, that's clearly better. Mm-hmm. No, no, not in an objective sense, but just subjectively. Mm-hmm. Like, I was picturing, for me personally, what it would have been the perfect way for this to continue, mm-hmm. just for my one perspective. And no right. one makes a game or writes a book or a movie or what have you, specifically for me. Mm-hmm. Of course not. So, obviously, that's, I'm not suggesting that they do. But that, that one perfect moment, oftentimes, it, it doesn't turn out better than I anticipate. I kind of have to try to to fight against that. And that's what I'm worried about with something like Horizon Zero Dawn because right. it's not like it's not from a series that we know. So something like, you know, the new Zelda or this even this new Mario game that feels like it's going to be pretty different in some ways from other Mario games. There's only so far they can push it because we know what a Mario is. Right. We know what Legend of Zelda is. So, but this is this He's is He's a guy with a magic hat. Right, sure. That's what that's who Mario. <laughs> yes, there you go. He's in this one, yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but there's only so far they can push it. Horizon Zero Dawn, yes, we we generally have we know the genre that it's in. We know um, essentially the world, we know the tone. Yeah. There's a lot of things we know about it, but at the same time, because we've never seen a game released like this in terms of this is not part of an established franchise. Right. So, we don't really know how it's going to go. Which is both exciting and terrifying. Mm-hmm. Or maybe another way to say it is, this has happened a thousand times before. It, oh, sure. A game oh, totally. that's we're excited about, not in an established franchise. How many times have we been disappointed? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just not worth the hype right now. I'm going to stand back and, and wait and see what people think of it. Mm-hmm. The problem that, is that's if where too I am. many people do that then nobody gets excited about it, and it ends up enslaved Odyssey to the West, which is one of my all-time favorite games mm. ever that was just a kind of a nobody-really-noticed-it game for PS2. I, I, I'm excited enough that to the point where, you know, if you pick up the game and play it and you go, damn, it's really great for, you know, this reason and here's why, then I'll get it. Yeah. I mean, that's basically where I am. PS3. So. It was PS3. Yeah. I still haven't played Enslaved Odyssey to the West. I know. I've Same got a game. copy. I need to just throw it your direction. What system, though? Uh, PS3. Do you have a PS3? No, no PS3. See, this is the problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll loan you my entire PS3 system if you loan me your Wii U. This solves all the problems. Maybe. 
<laughs> so, Jim, I know you and I are both excited about Persona 5. Yes, that was one we didn't talk about last week. Mm-hmm. Just to, yeah, just mention that real quick. Persona 4, I mean, it's been, geez, years since that mm-hmm. one came out, too. I'm not going to look that one up, too, yeah. but it's, it's been a while. Originally on the PS2, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, Persona 5, I mean, it's been in development for at least five years. Does that sound right? You might be right. I'm not, I'm not okay. sure. But yeah, it's, it's been pushed back a few times. Uh, I kind of first became aware of it, I think, a couple of years ago now. Yeah, it's, it was announced for the PS3. I mm-hmm. know that for a fact. It was announced for the PS3 and a while ago. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, it wasn't finished when it was announced, but it was announced a long time ago. And now we're at the point where they're still going to release, release it for the PS3 for whatever reason. <laughs> but it's also going to be on the PS4, gotcha. thankfully. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, very, very much looking forward to that one. Um, it's... I, I got um, Tokyo Mirage Sessions FE on the Wii U, kind of hoping that that might scratch my itch for a Persona like. Mm. Um, but it doesn't. It doesn't do the same sort of thing. At least not that I've seen so far. Maybe I'm just not far enough into it. Um, but aesthetically, I'm, I'm much less interested in uh, a Japanese pop culture or pop icon culture than I am in uh, Jungian psychology, which has always been Persona's thing. Um, I find that aesthetic much more interesting, and also the the sort of life management stuff that happens um, is much more in depth in Persona than it has been so far in the uh, uh, Tokyo Mirage sessions. Yeah. So, um, definitely looking forward to Persona Five. Another one that came to my attention recently that I'm kind of intrigued by is uh, Near Automata, uh, which is apparently a follow up to a spin off of something. <laughs> I don't forget exactly, uh, but it's actually um, one of the reasons I'm interested in it is it's a collaboration between Platinum Games and Square Enix. Um, Platinum Games being known for a lot of their uh, brawlers like Bayonetta, Metal Gear Rising, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but it's also open world, supposedly. So I'm intrigued by this concept of an action RPG by Platinum in an open world. Um, the gameplay I've seen so far looks fairly, fairly interesting. Uh, kind of a neat uh, it's approach. A, it's a spinoff of the Drakengard series. Mm-hmm. And there was another game called Nier that, was re- that released back in 2010 but looks totally different. Mm-hmm. When I say totally different, I mean the the antagonist. I mean the protagonist in the first Nier is um, a heavily muscled guy who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, mm-hmm. and the protagonist in Nier Automata looks like uh, just like you know a skinny, cute girl, <laughs> basically. So quite different, night and day. Yes. <laughs> also a very different aesthetic. The first Nier kind of looks like it has this sort of Western fantasy. Yeah, aesthetic. it does. And Nier Automata has a very Japanese, mm-hmm. like, yeah, anime, I've seen that. Aesthetic. That one looks pretty cool too. Um, I know that we've got uh, the Torment Tides of Numenera is finally going to come out, Doc. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if you're excited for that as well. But, I am. Uh, I believe that's next month, right? Sometime in February. Once again. So another one that's kind of pushed. Everything's out. next month. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Although in that one, because that is a uh, PC release game, it's also more, I would say, more of a niche uh, title. I don't think it's as in danger of uh, losing attention just because the audience for it is I don't think the audience is going to grow or shrink, I think or right. can grow or shrink. I don't think it's really ever. It's not going to pull in new people. Yeah. Well, and that actually butts up to a point I was going to make, which is how much of a threat is a Nintendo console to something that is about uh, post-apocalyptic robots? Well, I mean, it, really, when it comes to Horizon Zero Dawn, I think I think big a lot, and not not the Nintendo console specifically, Legend of Zelda, because mm-hmm. they're both open world games. Yeah, they're both adventure. Yeah, they're both action. I mean, there there's a lot of similarities there, and you could I make mean, you could make the argument that this new Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild is a beautiful apocalypse game. You could make that That's argument. That's a good point. So yeah. there's actually a lot of overlap right. there. Fair point. Mm-hmm. Fair point. But when it comes to Torment Tides of Numenera, completely different gameplay. This is an RPG. A lot of a lot of um, Text heavy, text heavy mm-hmm. RPG. Mm-hmm. It's not doesn't have that like cinematic atmosphere that you know, say Breath of the Wild or Horizon Zero Dawn are, are going for. So it's a very different kind of game. It also is going to appeal a lot to people that may um, be more interested in tabletop gaming or than they are. So you're in saying video it's games. an enhanced visual novel? Um, well, it's 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 an RPG. It is a true role playing game. I love that you didn't deny that. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are elements of that. I will say it's just that there's a lot. There's also that element of the the hardcore number crunching role playing aspect, which is not present in a visual novel, but yeah. also not present. No, you make a really great. Right. You know what? I think that, that but not that's present in something like Skyrim either. Not present in that. Very either. true. So I think that's fodder for an entire episode, right there. Oh yeah. I think that's and <laughs> since we're budding up on the release of that game, I think it would be great to talk about it as we get closer to it. Hell, maybe we could do that as a as a roundtable at one point. Sure, maybe, maybe yeah. yeah. I think it's one that could appeal to our particular um, sensibilities. 
Um, and a few more I just want to mention real quick as we uh, start to wind this down. Uh, Ukulele is going to be coming out, um, which was a Kickstarter project from the guys who made Banjo Kazooie. It's kind of actually a spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie. Uh, so, are you a Banjo Kazooie fan? I, I, I had some fun with it back in the day. Can I admit something real quick? Sure. I hate Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> I've always hated oh, Banjo Kazooie. I've never been a Banjo Kazooie fan. I never played Banjo Kazooie. Well, we, we've always known you're a teleport person, Jim. So it's, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's just further evidence. I, I mean, I literally was having this conversation last night with with a um, couple other friends mm-hmm. about how I couldn't decide if I hate Crash Bandicoot or Banjo Kazooie more, mm-hmm. but I hate them both. <laughs> okay. And I came to the conclusion that I hate them both equally. Like, like if I could, like if it was a situation where I had to save one of them from falling off a cliff, I'd somehow try to try to reach to grab them both and just leap off the cliff with them just to uh. save, spare. The world, <laughs> spare the world of another Crash Bandicoot or Banjo Kazooie. Why, why do you have to go with them? Well, because I had to save one. So uh, my trick was I would reach uh, down to like make I'm it like, to make it look like you made an effort. Yeah, it's like okay. the Batman choice. You know, mm. do I, which one do I love more? That kind of thing. <laughs> okay, but how do you feel about Sonic? Uh, Which was another one I was going to mention. Love hate. <laughs> some some Sonic games I like, and some I don't. Okay. Kind of a love hate. Right. Well, so, how, how's I, the love hate relationship going to end up in, in 2017? So, as the official <laughs> out of the closet Sonic fanboy or Sonic fanboy of Sanic. the show, Sanic. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Sonic Mania, uh, mm. which is going to be coming out oh, this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of a modern reimagining of Genesis era Sonic. Um, and then the uh, whatever it's going to be called, Project Sonic 2017, is coming out sometime in the holiday. And it looks like it's going to be my initial impression from the teasers is going to be kind of a follow up to Generations. Wait, these are two different games? Two different games. Somehow I had it in my head that it was the same game. They announced them at the same time. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so they, they showed a lot more about Sonic Mania, and then Sonic 2017 was kind of hinted at. Now, what systems are these on? Um, I think Sonic Mania is going to be on a bunch. I think it's going to be Wii U, Switch, uh, PS4, Xbox One, mm. PC, pretty much everything. Um, and uh, Sonic 2017, I think think might be coming out on Switch. I'm not sure if they confirmed that or not. Um, now, are you a werehog in either of these? Can you be a werehog? I'm not aware of any werehogs okay. in either. <laughs> uh, Probably for the best. Like, like I said, the, the teaser for 2017 um, seemed to suggest that it's going to be kind of a follow-up to Generations, which I think was actually a really good game. Hmm. They had this... That's uh, what I hear. I, I hear it was good. Mm-hmm. I never actually had a chance to play it. My, my one big complaint with that game, one, the boss fights weren't very good. That was kind of a, a problem. Mm-hmm. But... Um, the biggest issue I had with this basically you play each level as modern Sonic, or at least modern Sonic at the time, and classic Sonic. Yeah, and with different um, gameplay styles, yeah. right? Like either Sonic Adventure mm-hmm. or the old Genesis style. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't quite Sonic Adventure style. It was more like uh, Sonic Colors and um, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, okay. The issue I had with it is that modern Sonic uh, does this thing where they go from like third person over the shoulder and then transition into side scrolling. Um, but they did so much of that um, in Generations that. Like the thing that bugged me is you spend an entire level as classic Sonic doing side scrolling, and so I felt like they spent way too much time doing side scrolling in modern too, where like seventy, eighty percent of the game was all side scrolling. What system did you play it on? I played it on PS3. Okay. So, but I okay. uh, really, really enjoyed that game. I have a feeling that um, if they take a similar approach with this new one, it'll be quite good too. So, yeah, looking forward to those. So there, are, there are guaranteed a ton of games that we didn't talk about, mm-hmm. um, but. There's plenty of time to talk about them throughout the year. Oh, yeah. And just because we didn't mention one you're looking forward to doesn't mean we're not looking forward to it or going to play it. Mm-hmm. So. Stay tuned this year. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 90 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our talk on our most anticipated games of 2017. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.